Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome, my name is Victor Massas, Director of Lloyd Public Library. We'll go ahead and uh, get started here. I think uh, it's going to be a very full, uh, full presentation, full conversation afterwards. As always, I want to thank the State Line Community Foundation for providing the lunches for today's, uh, today's uh, event. And uh, today we have Mark Duff, who's the finance director for the school district of Beloit. And he'll be giving a presentation, the fourth in our series. Uh, we had the city of Beloit, we had um, Blackhawk Technical College in Rock County, and then uh, now the uh, school district of Beloit. Those are the four entities on your property taxes. Although I, it was just pointed out to me by Roger Dutcher, that in the newspaper, it actually called it a poetry tax. So, and, and, and he wasn't sure, that typo, uh, he wasn't sure if, it, if they taxed you by the meter or the stanza or whatever. But, so here we are today, it's appropriate, we're at the library for that, um, on your property taxes. And uh, so I think we are all set. Uh, what we're gonna do is start with a little video. Usually uh, Professor Laura Grube is here and she gives her uh, a quick introduction because on our website, on our webpage for the Know, know Your Local Government series is her, um, uh, what she, she would do is give a quick definition of her paper um, that she wrote along with uh, Jeff Adams that really digs deep into the property taxes and how those are constructed and state aid and all that kind of stuff. So that has been sort of the underpinning for the series um, regarding the property taxes, and then with our four presenters saying how each of their entities, entities, what they get, how they use it, etc. So just lastly, it is the series is really founded on what is and not what ought to be. And so that's worked really well for us, is hearing from the finance director, this is what it is. This is this is the money we get, this is how we use it. And it's not whether it's being used or whatever, right or wrong necessarily, because then you start to s slide into the more the political sphere, um, all of which we should all be very interested in, but without this basis, we can't really uh, make informed uh, uh, conversations and decisions. So with that, there will be Q&A at the end, at least at the beginning, sticking to the question, sticking to um, Mark's presentation. And then there'll be a little time at the end where um, a Dr. Garrison, uh, superintendent for School District of Beloit, will come up and he's gonna have a chance to kind of talk about the listening sessions. There's a number of them that are gonna be across the city related to the referendum. So I think uh, with all that kind of laid out, we'll see where we go. So Laura Groove's video and then Mark Duff. Why should you know your local government? Well, first, local government affects our day-to-day -day life and our quality of life. Decisions by the local school board, for example, impact the quality of education that our children receive. Decisions by the city have ramifications for public policing and public safety, the state of the roads and intersections, and the quality of the parks in our neighborhoods. Second, it's easiest to affect
small cities and towns especially, it's easier to have your voice heard. And third, local government decisions absolutely impact your pocketbook. If you're a property owner, you pay for local government through your local property tax. Of course, local governments collect revenue for residents for fees and other sources as well. For this current series and Know Your Local Government, we've invited representatives from the four active charity districts. Those are the City of Beloit, Black Hawk Tech, Brock County, and the Beloit School District to share information with us focusing on finance Adams and I have also written a short informational document on our local property tax bill. That document explains the language and values presented in the property tax bill, goes through how property rates, property tax rates are calculated, and also explores what property taxes might be if Boyd does not receive generous state aid. If you're interested to learn more about your property tax bill, then you can find that document on the Know Your Local Government Finally, I want to thank the Boyd Public Library for hosting the series and also thank Sarah Tinder from the Statewide Community Foundation for providing lunches for the series. Okay, so I, I was uh, introduced, I'm Mark Duff. I'm, uh, uh, I start, so one of the things in my past history is that I used to work at the Racing Unified School District for 13 years. I ended at, I retired as uh, the CFO of the Racing Unified School District. So I'm technically retired, but I do come out of retirement to help out school districts when they have vacancies. So you do have a, va had a vacancy in the Executive Director of Finance and Operations position since last year in February, and uh, then the Director of Finance just left to take the position in Madison. So I'm kind of helping out filling that, but I'm part-time. So. I'm doing, uh, trying to help uh, the team hold things together um, uh, in supporting uh, the finance and operations at, at the school district employee. So, um, and we do have a lot of the Purple Knight team here. Uh, so uh, I am at the disadvantage of being a temp villain, uh, but we did hire a new um, uh, executive director of finance and operations. We'll be starting in a little over two weeks, Bob Che from the Marshall School District. So you will have a new full-time person, new team, person on the Purple Light team, and uh, that's, that'll be great for the school district. And uh, uh, so I'm still, I'm, so hopefully I can provide uh, some insight um, on the school district's budget. And, uh, but I also am at the disadvantage that I'm a part-time person, I don't have history, and, uh, but we'll do our best, and if I can't answer the question, we'll get back to you, or someone on the team will, uh, who's here. So, uh, I'm going to start this. There. So, um, this is the, was supposed to be last week, but it was horrible weather. So, thank you for changing that, because I, I live in New Berlin, and so I commute here uh, to, uh, to work. Um, so, so the first thing I, I patterned this this um, presentation based on the, what the city did. Uh, so it's uh, they gave me a structure of things to go over. So this is the organizational structure of the uh, school district of Beloit. Um, so we have the board of education, and the one employee of the board is Dr. Garrison. So Dr. Garrison started recently. Uh, he hit the ground running, and um, so he is the new. Uh, head of uh, the administration and the school district. So uh, it is the district is broken into these five different departments, and uh, we do have. Is, almost, is everybody here from each department? So that's great. So this is the Purple Knight team. I don't. Hopefully, I'm saying that right because sometimes. Uh, okay. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, broken into teaching, learning, and equity. They uh, do a lot of the instructional curriculum. Uh, school work, so this is a big department. Pupil services is also a big department. They provide uh, uh, special education services and um, uh, social workers, psychologists, a lot of those um, 
very important pupil services needs that sometimes are forgotten, but it's extremely important. Um, finance and operations, so this is, uh, I have Bob Chady's name up there, so he's taking over uh, in a couple of weeks, but finance and operations has the whole financial structure of the district, but it also has transportation. Um, so people transportation, all the school buses. We also have uh, food service uh, facilities. Um, so that's another important area. So they do all the custodial services, uh, all the stuff behind the scenes, uh, maintenance of the buildings. We have uh, plumbers and electricians and, and all those types of important work. Making sure the garbage from the schools taken, you know, so there's a lot of very important things, but he's also leading an effort on make sure buildings are where they should be for uh, instruction. Uh, DE is the head of human resources, so that's uh, uh, make sure we have all of our staff needs done. Human resources is also a very important one on recruitment of our staff. And uh, in addition, we have communications and marketing with Monica. So she uh, sends out all the great news of what's going on in the school district. So that's the organizational structure. And then, um, so, oh, I guess I should have done that. So they also have uh, things like leadership and equity, STEAM program, that's science, technology, environment, engineering, ag, uh, arts and math. Music. Music. Math. Then all the early, early literacy, professional development, there's a lot of CTE, that's uh, um, technical education, alternative education, things like that. So these are some of the departments in her area. And then, uh, these, I guess I should have gone to this before trying to explain it. <laughs> but, uh, nursing services, safety, security, enrollment. And we also are required in federal law to provide services to homeless students, so there's a, a lot of federal requirements for that. Uh, and supporting those students. Uh, and then uh, finance and operations, we have facilities, food service, transportation, also the technology, and then risk management. Human resources, benefits, employee relations, and then marketing and then community outreach. So there's probably more that they do, but this is a bullet point of all what the departments do. This is the school board of the school district of Beloit. So they're, uh, like we say, they're responsible for doing the goal, strategic vision. They recently did approve a new strategic plan and updated it. Uh, they set the policy to oversee the operations of the district. And they also have several board committees. So the business operations and finance, so provide weekly updates to this committee. There's a governance committee, work on the policies of the school district. Human resources, they review staffing and different things like that. Uh, teaching, learning, equity, pupil services, they review um, uh, some of the academic programming and status of uh, different programs in our classrooms. And then the policy committee. Um, <coughs> policy comes up with the different policies of the district. The you know, board will set a policy that the board must operate under, or the administration must operate under uh, policies like uh, uh, different policies related to how students in the classroom transportation policy, there's a whole number of policies. It's all listed at our website. Um, this is the strategic plan. Uh, uh, this is the general priorities of the district in the areas of equity, uh, the whole child, culture and leadership, engagement, and finance. So these objectives and strategies, so these are just the priorities, but there's also strategies behind each of these priorities on um, what needs to be implemented in meeting the strategic plan goal. So um, these were recently approved, I think, last year, and uh, uh, this will provide <coughs> guidance to the administration and goals and strategic goals and what should be met. And, and practices in budgeting and finance is that the, the financial system should fund the strategic goals of the district. So having this in place is very important because we that guidance and then it, now it's kind of my job and Bob's job to make sure we can fund it fund it so that we can achieve these goals so uh, they wanted us to go over the budget process so this is our budget timeline and we recently updated it but uh, in February uh, the team starts working on their budget 
um, budget priorities and strategies. Um, and then before February, we there is work that's being done. So we start doing some of the projections and work behind it to start setting up for this. Um, we we have, should be starting right now our department and school initial budgets, and then we will be having the principals and department heads enter their um, budgets into the the system based on uh, the budget priorities set by the leadership. Um, we will be starting uh, this month, later next month, we're, we're reviewing our staffing for the next year. Um, so there's work being done on setting that whole system up. Um, in addition, um, of August, um, oh, this is what it was for this past budget, just for what it's worth. They began finalizing the budget in August, and then they had a hearing in October. So the school year already started in September. And the way um, district finances work, they start your school year, but don't adopt your budget and get all your finances and figures from the state until after the school year starts. Um, we update all of it based on all the new revenue limit uh, certifications and the enrollment of the district, and then we adopt the levy and the budget at the end of October. So one of the things we did was we updated the budget, we're updating the budget process for next year. So things were a little um, done later in the school year. And uh, we, most school districts adopt a timeline that gets an in, uh, earlier work done. You adopt more of an interim budget and then just update it later. So these are some of the changes um, that we're implementing for the current year budget where we will work through, it's a similar timeline, but we will actually work to try and adopt an intro budget in June. Um, and then we will have an annual budget hearing in September rather than um, in October. So it'll give a little bit more time for a hearing before the final budget is adopted. Um, the other thing is this is, this is the year, um, the school district is significantly funded by state funds. And so every, uh, the state operates on a biennial two-year budget. So school districts every two years are nervously waiting for what the state will do with our financing. And we usually don't know that until July, sometimes August with the governor's vetoes. So we have no idea what the state's gonna do with the budget, yet we're planning for next year's uh, budget. So uh, the governor recently proposed his budget but the, you know, the legislature in the past um, few budgets significantly changed uh, uh, the budget from what Governor Evers has proposed. So um, this is something that we monitor closely because of um, the extensive amount of funding school districts are dependent upon. So um, we're hoping that this is a more traditional uh, budget adoption structure uh, and it will allow for earlier input and having an interim budget done sooner. So this is the, the district's budget by um, the different funds that we have. In school districts, we kind of break everything into funds based on what DPI does. So um, the general fund is where the bulk of all of our operations are done. Um, so uh, in 21, 22, we had about $100 million of expenses in the general fund. Those were the audited actual expenses. And our budget was 99.5 million. So it actually went down slightly. Um, special education fund um, is $15.8 million. That did go up a little bit um, by about uh, five, six hundred thousand dollars so um, there was a slight 3% increase in the special education services. But this is the budget, and sometimes uh, where we end up is different than what we budget, but usually it's pretty close. Uh, we do have debt service funds. Um, so these are um, funds that are borrowed for facility projects and different things like that. The last year they did pay off quite a bit of um, debt, which saved the district uh, interest so this was, that's why this is a larger amount. Um, currently we're budgeted at $5 million, which is less, but um, we're still waiting. Uh, this could change 
uh, depending on the results of the referendum. If we um, pass the referendum, it's likely uh, we will pay off more debt earlier. Uh, if not, we will maintain the, the regular debt payment schedule um, to help stabilize um, um, our finances and the tax budget. We also have a food service fund, which is about, last year it spent $4 million. It did have a jump. Um, food service program changed some of their meal offerings for students, uh, which increased some of the costs. But we're also investing in uh, food service equipment and uh, improvements. Uh, so sometimes this is, some of this is a one-time increase. But we're also making sure that the food service program is paying for expenses that are related to food service. And one of the things we found in the past is there are sometimes general fund expenses that really should have been paid for by the food service fund. So we're working to make sure that the general fund is for general purposes, for education, our students, and food service pays for things related to food service. So that's part of that change. Uh, we do have a, uh, a number of little funds. Uh, we have the community service funds, special project funds, cooperative program funds. The special project funds is uh, a lot of schools do fundraising um, and have um, uh, clubs. And uh, so this, you, know, you can see it's a much smaller amount, but like uh, uh, many of uh, the high schools and uh, intermediate and elementary schools have different clubs and those all run through here and a lot of times they sell cookies or <coughs> things like that. Um, so it's a much smaller uh, fund. Mark, how many um, pupils is that covering? How many students? It's about 5,700. Is it about, uh, about that amount? So. Um, So total expenditures, $130 million. So, but it should be uh, remembered that supply plate debt service fund for one time allowance. And then the other thing to keep note is there's these college interfund transfers. So embedded in a lot of this is a, uh, a total expenses is $10 million of the general fund goes to the special education fund to pay for those services. So our actual spending is $120 million last year, so the general fund subsidizes the special education fund because uh, 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 the general fund covers it because it, we don't have enough state and federal funding to pay for the special education services. So that's the structure that is done to set that. Um, so these are the budget priorities that we funded in this dis in the district's budget. So we have a lot of really cool things that are going on. We have a whole literacy initiative with uh, a K-5 adoption of materials and professional development. Uh, there's this learn platform. So it's a uh, uh, read yourself. And I think probably Teresa could probably explain some of these better, but. Um, audit, it's an auditing system for integrated technology to determine which programs are delivering the best um, outcomes. So there's probably a structure for looking at our educational programs and a curriculum and making sure that they're meeting the outcomes. So that's a really good thing because we want to make sure that our programs are effective for students. So this helps us uh, um, figure that out. There's a whole, there's a number of math curriculum pilots going on and with uh, um, teaching, uh, Professional development, so our educators can um, do that at the elementary level. Um, so one of the things that they do in this district is they do they pilot it and then and then uh, do a full implementation once we've, we've uh, piloted it. Uh, there's a whole initiative on social emotional behavior. It's number a number of programs and curriculum at the elementary and secondary levels uh, for students and these areas. Missy could probably explain some of those if you ever want, if you want to know that. There's a whole 4K curriculum pilot, and then uh, so it's a pilot going on once again for the curriculum, and then they'll recommend full adoption uh, sometime later this year, or this spring. Uh, there's a whole virtual learning program, and it's now uh, 
increase the number of students it serves to 121 students. And then there's the career and techn technical education program, so they expanded a number of these programs in work-based learning and certification opportunities. So sometimes, you know, we look at all these numbers, and uh, but there's actually programs behind the scenes that the budget is funding. These are newer initiatives that were funded by the budget. So. So this is a pie chart of uh, who, where our revenues are coming from. So I was, I'm gonna, this is only for the general fund. So remember I went over that, that listing. The general fund is what, where the bulk of our uh, funds are spent. So as you can see, 81% of the district's funds come from the state. So this is the, one of the highest poverty districts in the state and uh, the formula that the state has for supporting public education it provides more aid to districts so that we can have more equitable education across the map. So you may have a very affluent district hardly gets any state aid at all. Uh, and Beloit does get 81% of state aid. So the portion of federal aid uh, that we get, uh, there's a uh, number of programs that aid programs and grants the district gets. A lot of them are targeted at students in poverty. The title program is an example. We have programs for English language learners. We get federal grants for that. We also have that, um, there's something called ESSER. There's, uh, these are um, federal funds that were provided to school districts during the pandemic. And uh, we do have, still have some of those funds remaining and those are supporting our budget as well. You can see uh, there's uh, some revenue or interdistrict funds. So we do have some students coming to the district from another school district. So we get tuition for that. And then this is the small amount of how much your local property taxes and fees are funding in the budget. So it's like very little of the general fund. So the other big fund uh, the district has is the special education fund. So this is once again showing the pie chart and where the revenues are coming from. So about 27% comes in special education aid. 13% um, we do get, uh, I don't know if it's IDEA still, but we do get federal IDEA funds. Sometimes they change the acronyms of it. And, uh, and I, I always remember the old one. And then, uh, like I mentioned, the general fund subsidizes the special education fund um, for whatever state and federal funds will cover. So that's about 60% of those funds. That's about a $15 million budget. We are required by federal and state law to provide these programs for students of special needs. And uh, there, there is an additional expense over and above their instructional. So this is all the different funds. This is the pie chart of the thing that I showed you before. 76% is the general fund. 14% is the special education fund that serves 5% of food service here. And then you have all these other little funds. It's a fraction, so I didn't even show up. It's like 200,000 of a $117 million. So, um, so this is, uh, you can see, your total revenues are 116 million. Total expenses, 117, 818 million. So right now we are spending more than revenues coming in. Um, so the budget, unfortunately, um, was passed with about $4 million budget deficit because of the uh, challenges the district is facing. But uh, work is being done in the current year to uh, close that gap. And uh, we're well on our way to uh, put a significant dents in that so that we don't have the deficit that we're facing currently. So this is by function. So this is what we spend it on. And so I have it kind of color coded. So the blue, maybe it's purple, it depends on that. I try to use purple in this district. So, um, so this is more instruction and instructional support. So this is the pie chart for that. 
Um, so you can see that you know, uh, instruction is your classroom, uh, teachers, uh, supplies, and materials. Instructional support would be things like um, librarians, guidance counselors, nurses, social workers, um, professional development for teachers, that's, you know, so it supports instruction for the teachers. So this is supporting instruction and pupil services, a lot of pupil services in here. So that's green one. Facilities, transportation, business services. Yeah, I'm going to look on my computer screen because I can see it better. Yeah. So uh, that's about seven percent. But you should, uh, in many respects, facilities and transportation, like you have tra pupil transportation, supports the students. So even though it's not, and we need kids to get to school mm -hmm. uh, for their instruction. Um, we also need good buildings to provide an instructional environment for our students. So um, this ultimately, we're all about educating kids, so this does support our students. Um, the, this would be tech, technology or student technology and HR. Um, and there's a number of you know, other support services that go into this category. And then, um, Well, that's technology, okay. So that's this one up here. It's technology, and then this would be uh, central services. That would be like a print shop, um, um, non-instructional non professional development, like administrative professional development, um, things like things like that. So, and then um, so there is another category. Uh, and so these are all um, being done, but there should be should be noted up here is that we have a significant portion of this budget that are providing payments to um, student student that are being educated in a different charter school, that are being educated in private schools, and that are open enrolling to another district. So you can see that's a significant part of the budget, and uh, uh, that's. Over 13 percent of the district's general special education budget goes to pay for students attending, in, uh, not being educated uh, here at the school district of Beloit in their schools. And I'm not keeping track of time, so if I'm running late, can I go? Yeah. <laughs> Signal. Um, so these are so those are the functions, but these are the objects we spend it on. So. The school district is very uh, staff you know, um, intensive. So you can see over 60%, 62% is on salaries and benefits. And you can have it broken out by fund. Um, purchase services. So that does include the tuition payments for the charter school, tuition payments for private schools, uh, open enrollment. To, so that's like $13 million of this purchase service category. In it right here. So, um, but purchase service also includes school buses, um, things like that, uh, for uh, utilities, um, in, uh, repairs of our buildings, uh, solid waste, you know, picking up garbage services and different things like that. Non capital, those would be for supplies and uh, materials like. Uh, computers, paper, uh, uniforms, um, things like that. Capital is that those are big expensive items like computer servers, trucks for the school district, um, uh, lawn, you know, expensive lawn mowers, things like that. Um, we did start a capital lease, that's uh, a computer lease. So we do have that started. Um, so we were spreading out the payment of computers for staff. We also insure, have insurance for the district. And then this is what I mentioned before, we have fund transfers. So um, this is the transfer of $10 million to the special education fund. Then we have some other issues and other objects. So this is what it kind of breaks that down. So. Okay, this is the tax rate. You can see 
that tax rate was not that long ago, 11 and a half, 11.7, dropped. And it was last two years, it was 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. This year it dropped to 478. So um, a lot of that, uh, you can see the state average for K-12 school districts is 770. So we're way below the state average now. And uh, so uh, later on, the referendum will be discussed with the goal that's been discussed at our meeting, the meetings and with the boards that we would have a goal of keeping that flat, the referendum even if it went to pass it. So um, some of that reason is that there was a, uh, here's the tax rate influences I put up there. Um, the tax rate, uh, you had a, a uh, reassessment here. Um, so some people's property values went up by 40%, their assessment. And uh, so, um, but then all across the state, we had people, the tax bases increased. The city also has something called a tax incremental financing district where it's a professional development zone and they retired one of those districts. And so when that's retired, that tax base that gets put on to um, uh, generate tax revenues for the school district. Um, we also levied $6.5 million less of referendum debt levy so, um, and then we also received additional CA for paying off some of that debt the prior year. So one of the things that to keep in mind is there is a, a state revenue limit that tries to control the taxes and what you can spend in your district. And then if the voters agree to go above that limit, um, you, you have that for a period of time. So there was a 2012 referendum and uh, so that was outside the cap. And um, over time they paid off the debt and now they're paying that off quicker. And so a lot of that, those debt payments are starting to drop off. So that was out, outside the cap. So, um, so you were able to have this 478 where the bulk of that levy was for referendum approved debt which will expire. So that's where um, that referendum, referendum approved debt will expire. And so that's where there is capacity to, if the referendum were passed, to keep the tax rate flat. This is kind of how you do the math for how much we're allowed to spend for our budget from the state. We have a number of student membership. So I mentioned before, it's like 5,700 students in the classroom, but we also levy taxes for the charter school students are part of our membership. And then um, we also levy for students that attend other school districts. So that's part of our membership. So those aren't the number of students in our school. You multiply that by the state amount per pupil, gives us 63 million. Then the state does provide us, like as you decline in enrollment, the state gives you a cushion to let you ease into declining enrollment. Because sometimes when you lose students, it takes a while to consolidate classes. Um, you uh, uh, make, take actions for making efficiency. So they give us a three year time frame to deal with declining enrollment. Um, so that, that's what these two are. And then, and then there also we had a, there's a, uh, there's certain allowances the state has for you to levy for things you, sh you were allowed to, but it came in a year after, so it's like 3.4 million years. So this gives you your total revenue limit authority. I have it all listed down here what some of those are, and, uh, but that's what gives us that <laughs> 60 to $8 million of revenue limit authority. So, um, to figure out our tax rate, you take your revenue limit authority, you go minus your state aid, and that gives you what your tax levy is for the general fund. So, um, our state aid was 68 million, our revenue limit authority was 68.8, 
and then we had some other aid that we received. So for the general fund, our total tax levy was $129,000. So it really wasn't that much for the general fund, but the bulk of what we levied was for debt, which was referendum approved. So 98% of our total levy was for debt that will be expiring. Um, so some of the things um, that inf influences that amount is uh, your property value. So um, equalized property value also impacts what your tax rate is and things like that, and then your membership as well. So these are the different things that are included in there. And we also include in there um, um, charter school students and things like that. So these are the district's budget challenges. The district has been dealing with declining enrollment, and I have a graphic of that, that there's been declining enrollment, which creates a strain because our funding is dependent upon how many students we have. So if it declines, it means you have to become more efficient um, with that. So that's one of the challenges. We've also had uh, financial issues. The state over the past few years has provided no increase in funding, even though we had 8% inflation, 4%. Uh, so we've had to absorb that, but the state did, did say, legislature, they said, you have this federal funding, so you're gonna use that to pay for your, um, some of your costs that the state didn't provide you. So, um, so we, the district has included about over $6 million in these federal funds to our, in our state, in our budget this year, to cover some of these uh, inflationary increases that the state didn't provide to us. And this also, we want to be able to sustain our program, but we also, the past few years, uh, we've had uh, deficits that um, are causing a strain for the finances of the district, so there's been a fund balance decline that needs to be addressed. We also have some facility needs, um, so the, um, and I'll go over that a little further, but then some of that all led to, all of these, some of these budget challenges led to work for reconfiguration of the district. So there's work being going on with that, but also it also led to the proposed referendum that we have. So some of these challenges um, are directly then being responded to, what work is being done, but we have reconfiguration and also the referendum will help with these challenges. So this is the, Chart I told you about, this is you know, how many students we have, but you can see it's dropped here quite a bit. And if you add in uh, the charter school, this is how many students are at the charter school, just right over there, I think, and um, they can see that that's, well, not that long ago you had over a thousand more students in the classrooms. So that's something that the district has to deal with uh, because of the reduced finances but also uh, uh, be more efficient. And uh, so that's, that's one of the challenges the district has to deal with. Um, one of the things I was mentioning is that this is the pipeline, it's supposed to be a pipe. And uh, back in 17, 18, you had about 1,800 students coming in at the early grade levels, and you had about 1,800 kids at your high school. So really with very little difference. So your pipeline was supporting it all the way through so that you could say, well, it's gonna be pretty stable. So that's changed here. You can see how now with uh, enrollment declines and birth rate declines, uh, your pipeline at your early grade level was 1,400 and your high school enrollment is about 1,700. So there's, there's a there's a discrepancy that has to be addressed at some point because the pipeline is much smaller. So at some point, the enrollment declines are gonna hit the uh, later grades. So these are, this is what uh, needs to be planned out and worked on. So uh, as I mentioned, the contributing factors of this decline is birth rate decline. You have the independent charter uh, come in and has about over 450 students private school vouchers, so there's a, kids can now get a funded uh, voucher to go to private schools, and 
and that's paid for by the district. And then you have open enrollment where kids go to other bordering school districts for their education. So this is a kind of the do the math thing. So the revenue limit provides two year cushion for enrollment in impact. So I, one of the things I wanted to mention, so here's the math, you lost a thousand students times the 1049 on the revenue limit, means at some point you have to cut 10 and a half million dollars uh, to become more efficient. Um, that's what the state situation does. So over this period of time, that's how much you've lost. So work is being done to address this, but it does take time. And uh, but, um, work is being done to deal with that. Now I wanted to mention that um, the state revenue limit provides a three-year cushion, so it gives you some time, three-year plan to deal with the decline. But the charter school enrollment takes it out just like that. So we have, um, we don't get three years to plan for what the independent charter students take. It, we basically have to deal with it right away. And sometimes we don't know what that enrollment is until after the school year starts. So it is a challenge. Uh, it's a new normal for what district has to deal with, but that is a challenge we have to do. But um, hopefully this math makes some sense. So as I mentioned, uh, as someone, I think the professor said I should talk a little bit about the charter school and the impact on the district. So um, it is an independent charter school. It was authorized by the UW System Office of Education Opportunity. So the, dis the school district didn't authorize it. So sometimes school districts can have their own charter school. But this one is an independently little mini public school district operating in the school district. And it can take enrollment from any school in any area. So it can take it from Turner, I don't, it can take it from school district of Beloit. So, um, and then each of these school districts then have to pay tuition to the charter school. And uh, so one of the things is our revenue limit is $10,049. And the charter school gets $9,264 under state law. So there is a difference, that's so about 85%, but it's not an apples to apples comparison. Um, like school district of Beloit and other school districts, we have, we pay for private school transportation. Charter school doesn't. So that's an extra expense we have to do. We provide special education services to private schools. Charter school doesn't. Um, so there are some significant differences between what is funded by the charter school and what we have funded. So it's not apples to apples. But um, the other thing I, is that all of your school buildings in this area are owned by the taxpayers. Charter school is not owned by the taxpayers. So, um, so that's one of the things that is a difference. There are differences between how each of these work. And we pay about $4 million to the Lincoln Academy. I think there might be one Two kids that go to a different charter school, but it almost all goes to the academy. And that's fine. This is what the state law allows for. This is what the new structure is. I'm just, I was just told to talk about it. <laughs> and uh, I'm just trying to provide something where, you know, sometimes I think the charter schools say, well, it's different. We're getting underfunded. Well, but it, and that's fine too. They are getting less than what we get. But it is, it, it needs to be recognized. There are differences between what we have to fund and what they have to fund. And, and this, the wisdom of the state legislature and the governor will figure that out. So. And as I mentioned before, enrollment creates an immediate, immediate fiscal impact. Um, we do not have the three years to figure out how to address that loss. There is a little bit of demographic differences. Uh, students in poverty, 79, 71%. Lincoln Academy, under 60. So this was 21, 22. So things that might have changed for this year. Um, students with special needs and disabilities are 8%, we're at 15%. We spend our, um, our 
that contribution to the special education fund out of our general fund, we spent about $2,000 per student on that. So um, they have a lot fewer students, special needs. So there is, that's another difference. And we have a higher cost in this area that takes away from regular classroom instruction. And this is great that we do this. We need to support these kids. This is uh, something we have to do, but their cost structure is completely different than what we have. And we also have more English language learners as well. And then we have specialized programs for that. So this is kind of rounding some other things. How am I doing on time? Five minutes? Okay, I think I'm just right on time. Okay, so um, these are the things we talked about with declining enrollment. We have um, some unstable finances with structural deficits. I think what we've been spending out of our fund balance about, we've been down about $10 million. So uh, we're tr trying to restore our fund balance to what extra, you know, like best practices are in a school district is about a 20% fund balance. So we're down to about 14, 15%. So we're hoping that the referendum will help us restore this. And one of the challenges with restoring fund balance is that if we would have to cut further to restore it, so that it's a, it's a bigger challenge because we not only do we have to balance the budget, but if we have to cut further just to restore this, it creates a much greater fiscal challenge to deal with that. Um, so this is something that we're working on. And then another other budget challenges, facility needs. So even though the district passed a referendum in 2012, we still have a lot of facility maintenance needs uh, that need to be addressed. They're doing a com com uh, com comprehensive facility master plan to figure out what that is. Uh, it should be understood, the state school finance system does pretty much assumes you have to go to a referendum if you want to fix your building. So that's kind of what the practice is. So um, that, is, that proposed referendum has 19.5 million to uh, air condition and HVAC structures at the high school, improve the athletic fields, and then also fix roofs. So we want, we have about uh, uh, some roofing improvements that need to be done. And then there's an exterior safety improvement uh, entrance to the school. Um, and there's work being done on the reconfiguration where um, uh, we're moving 4K to grade five elementary schools rather than the 4K to three, and then the uh, four to eight, they're going to a more standardized <laughs> elementary and uh, intermediate school structure. And it'll also work to help have a more efficient school building structure. Oh, we have questions. So, right on, kind of on time. So, yeah. So first, uh, I just want let's let's applaud Mark. All right, now we're going to take uh, questions on his presentation, and then we'll have some more time. So, what we've done in the other uh, uh, sessions is we we've, we've run over. So, if anyone has to leave, if anyone's willing to stay, wants to ask questions, that is perfectly fine. It's sort of a soft one o'clock. But uh, let's take questions directly from Mark's presentation. If you can, raise your hand. Thank you. You, you showed the uh, Lincoln Academy out for us. I, I think, don't we open and roll about 800 kids out of the district? Yeah, so there's. Would you go, could you go, is it, would the analysis be the same? Um, in terms of the losses? So open enrollment out. That would be a similar situation. So the as a kid lose we lose a kid to open enrollment, you have the same situation where you have an immediate cost. So it's not a three year average. So you're exactly right. You could be a business manager someday. <laughs> so that is a challenge because like like I, I've been trying to do the budget and open enrollment, we don't know them until after the third Friday, late September, and we're trying to budget. And uh, sometimes you don't know until after the school year starts and you already have your staff in the building. So it is, it is what we deal with. So. Questions? I can ask it. Uh, what's the current policy on fund balance? You said the had goal was 
So the question is, what is the what is the policy on fund balance? The Board of Education has a policy on fund balance to have it at about 20% or higher. Um, so the, so we are below the, the board's goal, but I think they have like a floor of 14%. So, so the goal is really 20, but they said 14% is a floor, so we're right at that. So we're working diligently to make sure we don't go below that. Right. This is really great. Uh, there, I mean, there's a lot of interesting information here. Uh, one of the really kind of striking things is a $127 million budget, about $129,000 comes from our property taxes. Yeah. I mean, basically it's zero. So we're, and the, the per student expenditures, uh, we never see the total amount, but it's according to the Wisconsin uh, policy form, it's about 16, 17,000. So somehow we're spending 16 or 17,000 dollars per kid and our local property taxes pay nearly zero towards that. That's yeah. a big story. Yeah, so the, and I'd have to look at what the policy form has, but um, I have, So we do have, it is $10,000, $10,050 in re revenue limit. Actually the state average is 10,400 and something. So many districts are on average are getting more funding than the school district of Beloit on the revenue limit. So we're below the state average, but we do receive significant amount of funds to support students uh, from federal funds, students of poverty, um, these are all not included in the revenue limit, the federal funds and then this state aid. So there are some things that aren't included in that 10,049. But um, so for what it, the charter school does get special education aid for people aid. So they do get some of that as well. Um, so we'll go this way. And you mentioned the fund balance that needs to be restored. What's the fund balance for actually? So the fund balance is kind of like, uh, uh, we use it for cash flow borrowing. So, um, so cash flow. So we may make sure we have a cash in the bank to be able to pay people, pay our bills. The state provides the bulk of our funding. So we're, saw 80% funded by the state, but we don't get that until well over half the way through the school year, but we still have to pay everybody. So um, so we need we would need it for cash flow. The other thing is, uh, it's like a credit rating. So when you get your credit rating, your credit score, they kind of look, well, how much debt do you have? How much money do you have in the bank? What are your investments? We have the same thing. So our bond rating, when we want to borrow, is based on having a decent fund balance. And usually if you're 20%, you're under 20%, we may give you negative outlook, your borrowing costs will be higher. Uh, and so we, so having that fund balance at 20% will help us with our borrowing, cash flow, and it also is available for emergencies if we have uh, um, something happen at a school, we need to fix it quickly. So cash on hand, basically. Yeah. Much more concise than me. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. Hi, nice job. Um, so you indicated that the average state funding per pupil is about ten thousand five hundred dollars. Yeah. Ours is just over ten thousand. Yeah. What factors go into that calculation to determine what each school district's per pupil amount is? <sighs> Tim, do you remember this one? <laughs> Sorry. It's too long. It's a problem. <laughs> I, was, I used to be in the legislature. I served with Tim, and uh, sometimes I say I'm paying for my sins of what I did as a legislator by <laughs> working in a school district. But 
Uh, I think there comes a point where there was a time and at certain time where they locked in what your revenue limit is back in the 90s. And then over time, as your revenue limit increased, got your spending patterns increased, they, it adds to it. The other thing is the state then will increase certain amounts. So, um, so a big factor is the school district may have frozen in time their original revenue limit amount back in the day, which was much less than what other districts did. Some districts jacked up their spending right before the revenue limit was went into effect so that they would have that. I don't know what they did here on that. So you were cutting at that time. So then that ended up reducing your base for a long time. Um, so. Other questions? All right, so now we're going to kind of ease a little into a little referendum information. I'm going to let Dr. Garrison take that, take the mic up front. So rarely, rarely do we find men who willingly engage in hard, solid thinking. There's almost a universal quest for easy answers, half-baked solutions. Nothing pains some people more than having to think. And I'll be honest with you, this guy does a whole lot of thinking, and um, I appreciate his work um, as a consultant for the School District of Beloit. Not only that, I believe that the School District of Beloit has some, um, can you pass those out? Some immediate, some, some immediate requests that we are putting that we are putting towards the um, to the public. My hopes is that um, the information that you've heard today is, is in, insightful, gives you a little bit of how we actually run the school district, right? There's a lot of different things that happens with that conversation. I personally cannot explain all of that as eloquently as um, Mr. Duff did. However, my, my goal is that we can bring this information to you in bite-sizable amounts, where we can kind of break it down as you go. That makes sense? That's my goal. Um, naturally, I wouldn't get up here and go through all that as he just did, but I do a lot of this. I do a lot of these conversations in the public, where it's a little bit more bite-sizable as we kind of talk about how school districts are funded. In front of you right now are as a QR code. If you could do me a huge favor, take your phones out real quick. Take your phones out, and if you take your phone out and you go to your camera. Take your phone out and you go to your camera on your phone. And there's a QR code, that code that's in the front of that card there. You click on that yellow thing that's right in the middle of your screen. It'll pop up and it'll direct you straight to our website, okay? And on our website, if you scroll up on your phone now, scroll up on your phone, you will see a lot of information about our referendum. I'm not gonna go into that presentation because that's not my time, and this is uh, actually the time for Mr. Duff. My goal is just to get the information in front of you, but if you have a question, you can pop a question in there. Keep scrolling up, you'll see uh, our meetings that we have. Keep scrolling up, you'll see our in-person sessions, our virtual sessions. You will see some other information about our <laughs> referendum, but most importantly, you will have the opportunity to go to the source and get information. That makes sense? Um, there's a lot of different information that's floating around out here. And I always say, come to the school district to get the information that's most accurate that we want to present to the public. Town board is supposed to come to your answer. And on the other side of this conversation here is uh, just the questions. So you can see them, that's gonna be on the ballot. Um, nothing spectacular about that, but it at least gives you exactly what you'll see on the ballot. And again, the QR code is right on the back. You go to our website, you can see the information. Well, like, again, my goal has always been to make the information bite-sizable, all right? For all can understand it. Um, hopefully, um, you will have time to kind of go to our website, take a look at the information that we're presenting, and then make your informed decision at the polls um, April 5th. That's my time. I was given a quick three or four minutes to do that, and so that's, that's what I'm going to stick to. I, I, only if you want to, or if you're prepared. If anybody has any questions for Dr. Garrison based on what you saw uh, from Mark's presentation and how to kind of square that information or anything that's in your head, only if you're willing, there's all those other sessions. But did anybody that you would say, you know what, this would be just a clarification having both of them here? Well, I can speak loud enough. Okay. <laughs> so there's no way the students are not coming back. So there's going to be this deficit. This is really glaring. What are the plans? And then are you closing schools down? Are you less teachers? I mean, there's got to be some ideas to, you know, what's going on. That's a, that's a big 
big drop in the in enrollment. And it's not definitely not coming back. And so one of the things that I've, I've always stated is that this takes a lot of thinking. And so since I stepped into the school district of Boyd, that's what we've been doing. What are we going to do to address the conversations around declining enrollment? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we want to improve our own product. Um, I think every school district that's in this that's in this facility and in, in this in this community wants to improve their product, whether it's us or Turner, even the charter school. And so we want to improve our own product in the school district of Lloyd to get our families to start start back saying if they haven't already stated that we want to stay come back to our school district. That's the first thing we want to do. I think it's very important to address that we have had some student achievement conversations, but that's something that we want to get back to uh, from a Purple Knights uh, perspective. The second thing that we want to do is we have had already started having questions, um, not questions, conversations around the reconfiguration. Um, naturally, we used to be, a, well, this year, we're still a K-3, um, 4A, 9-12 school district. When this happened about 12 years ago or so, one could argue it was for a variety of different reasons, but overall, our community has not really um, been receptive to that conversation. And that's not just me saying that, it's also coming from different community members as well. And so the reconfiguration will bring us back to the conversation around K-5, K-3, 5, 6, 8, 9, 12. Um, it's kind of hard for some people to say, let's send our babies off to middle school. Um, yes, there are probably some that will say, uh, yeah, we're okay with it, and some will say, no, we're not, but overall, um, hasn't been very beneficial for us because once that happened, we started to see about three or so hundred more kids, you know, start leaving our district right around that third, third, fourth grade. And so now we're going back to that configuration. Hopefully, our parents will, will be in. A, hopefully, our parents will stay, stay with us now that our third graders will remain in their elementary school. That makes sense. Instead of going off to middle school, that's the second thing we're going to do. We we made some changes there. Naturally, there's going to be conversations around school closures. I like to call them repurposing of school buildings. Um, that impact will happen in the middle school. When, you take in two, when you're taking two, in this case, two grade levels and keeping them back in the elementary school, that means that you now have four smaller middle schools. We all have been in Beloit before, you know we have four middle schools. And with that being stated, technically with the numbers that we have in the middle schools currently, we could actually put them into one building. Okay, so school closures is a conversation. I like to say, technically, I've already stated that we're going to have at least two, at least two middle schools that we're going to have to repurpose, um, at least two middle schools, and so that's kind of where we are in this conversation now. So school closure, I'm sorry, repurposing of school buildings is something that um, we will have to explore. And so those three things are some of the things that we're doing right now, as it stands to trying to make sure that we make some adjustments in this conversation. Additionally. <coughs> We've, uh, so since I came in, as Mr. Dunn stated, uh, we've made some changes to address some of our budget constraints. Um, I did freeze some of the hirings currently that we have when I walked in starting in January. We still are hiring critical positions, but I did freeze some of the hirings. Naturally, there's gonna be some attrition that happens with teachers that come and say, you know what, mm, I wanna move to California or I wanna retire in Hawaii. Uh, so there's gonna be some attrition that happens and additionally, we've also started a conversation around what is that going to look like when we start to repurpose buildings. So there's a lot of great things that one could argue, great things that we're currently doing, and of course that we will be looking forward to doing in the future. Full answer there. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. More questions. Well, thank you very much. We've had uh, both the is and, well, they're all the is, and, and also looking toward the ought as, as we look forward. Hopefully, you all, you're leaving this room informed to be able to make informed decisions. And uh, if anybody else has any questions, <clears throat> this information will be on our website, like the previous presentations. And then, of course, there's the listening sessions that Dr. Garrison will be having as well. So, oh, and, and next month? Uh, next month. Mr. Brad Bowl back there for Turner School District of uh, Turner is going to be doing the same, a similar presentation um, uh, for that school district. So we hope to see you here for that as well. And uh, I guess just lastly, on your evaluations, if you have any ideas of for, you know, future programs like this or other entities or whatever that you would want to see in the same format and get this kind of information, 
please write those down and then we'll line those up and do the same kind of thing we're doing now. So thank you very much, have a good day.